Good afternoon. Um, today I want to talk to you about the prosecution of ISIS for the enslavement of the Yazidis, a small minority and religious group in uh, northern Iraq. Now I know that ISIS committed all kinds of atrocities and war crimes against civilians, but the reason I want to focus on the Yazidis is because I think their case is an extreme one. Now I'm not trying here to undermine the um, humiliation and the suffering felt by victims of sexual violence in general and sexual slavery in particular in other cases. And I'm not even trying to suggest that ISIS was the only uh, party to the conflict to commit crimes of sexual violence, or that the, the number of victims in this case far exceeded the number of victims in others. Um, I think that their case is an extreme one because of the level of organization and institutionalization that was done by ISIS, mimicking to a large extent the slave trade as it was done in the previous uh, century, complete with um, you know, slave markets and treating uh, victims as chattel. Now, also it was done openly and proudly and explicitly. Um, it all started it all started in August 2014 um, when ISIS attacked Mount Sinjar, which as you see, it's right next to Mosul in northern Iraq. Um, when they entered the village, they killed thousands of boys and men in open fields and in schools, and then they abducted at least 6,000 girls and women. Um, it soon became apparent that this was actually a sexual conquest, fueled by a fatwa or a religious, um, religious uh, decision. Um, by the ulama of ISIS, the Islamic leaders of ISIS, saying that it is not only acceptable for ISIS fighters to um, take these women as sabaya, which is Arabic for women uh, kept um, um, imprisoned in times of war and enslaved in times of war. It was actually their religious duty to do so. Now, other minorities under the control of ISIS were given three choices, specifically those that were considered to be um, from Ahl al-Kitab or people of the book and, and Islam. Uh, they were given the choice of either convert to Islam, pay al jizya or tax in exchange for protection, or face the sword. Now these three choices, they're not much, but they weren't extended to the Yazidis. Because according to the, uh, these Islamic leaders, the Yazidis belong to um, a devil worshiping group because of their special regard to their peacock angel or uh, Malik Tawus. Uh, because his story, to a large extent, according to them, resembles that of Iblis or the devil himself. So according to, the, um, to, to this fatwa, um, it is the religious duty of, the, of these fighters to convert uh, this group to Islam, and if not, just keep them as sexual slaves, because according to them, you can have sexual intercourse with these girls and women while still remaining uh, pure spiritually. Now, this sex trade, the, event, the, the, the resulting trade, was actually really organized. They, it started with hauling girls and women on open trucks, taking them to abandoned schools and um, uh, warehouses, and then th there they will record their names, their marital status, how many children do they have, and all of that, um, only to be placed in viewing rooms um, where they were inspected and marketed. Of course, uh, small groups will, were, were then uh, being um, um, formed. The most appealing women were sent to Raqqa to be uh, distributed among uh, ISIS leadership. Uh, some were kept by the uh, ISIS fighters who committed the attack. Um, as, as, one, um, as one fighter put it as a bonus to his salary, he kept few women, and then the rest were distributed among the slave markets established throughout the territory that they controlled. Now, I have to say that the slave trade was also highly institutionalized. I'm talking about formal priceless prices ranging between $300 
uh, for girls between one and nine to forty dollars and twenty dollars in some slave uh, markets. Uh, I'm talking about sale contracts being notarized by um, ISIS courts. I'm talking about uh, two departments that were established because as you know ISIS ran a bureaucracy uh, combining a lot of like departments and cabinets in order to coordinate the affairs of the state specifically in terms of education and health and tribal outreach and all of that so one of these was actually sl uh, slavery slave trade they used it to attract uh, recruits they used it to raise money so it was something that they um, relied on now, the two departments, one was called the Department of Slaves to supervise their treatment, and the other one was called Research and Fatwa Department. Now, the second one was responsible for issuing religious guidelines dealing with slaves, and they did issue um, two guidelines, one in 2014 and one in 2015. Uh, they openly acknowledged that, yes, this was slavery, um, that um, these women were considered to be the property of their owners to be inherited, that they allowed sexual intercourse with some girls even before reaching puberty, and they restricted sexual intercourse. Um, just, um, I mean, it's, they, it's open, but then the restriction was done so that they can uh, avoid incest and to uh, clarify uh, paternal lineage or nasab in Arabic. So, for example, they would prohibit uh, sharing slaves between fathers and sons. They prohibited um, having um, sexual intercourse with sisters at the same time. Ensure that the captive is not pregnant before having intercourse with her, because then, if she is pregnant, they can't resell the, the victim. And this is very interesting because um, one report that I read said that some doctors were really surprised that there weren't more pregnancies and more children from these, um, from these relations. And it was because a lot of fighters forced these women to have uh, um, uh, pills to prevent the pregnancies. I think one of the things that really shocks me, and I think it um, shocked a lot of people as well, is that um, ISIS never shied away from calling this act slavery. You know, I find that in other cases uh, involving um, crimes of sexual violence, specifically sexual slavery, I find that the perpetrators um, try to call the act by a different name to lessen the gravity of the crime, right? So after World War II, for example, the Japanese who acknowledged later on that yes, we forced um, hundreds of thousands of uh, girls and women, we reduced them to becoming um, a, a comfort women. And we did operate comfort stations throughout the territory that we controlled. They never said that it was slavery. They said that it was uh, wartime prostitution. In Africa, they don't call them slaves. They call them bushwives, right? Uh, in the um, uh, international uh, criminal tribunal former Yugoslavia, um, in the Kunarak case, I know that the defendant said that, well, it wasn't slavery because these women were not locked up that um, uh, they didn't mind the, um, the sexual acts. But in this case, in addition to all of, these, um, uh, all of these things that I just mentioned, making the slavery, slavery de jure, uh, is the fact that they went online, specifically in their English online magazine, Dabak, and they said that, yes, we're reviving slavery before the hour. Um, one specific uh, author, a female, Um Sumayya al Muhajira, wrote with letters drip of pride. Yes, the Yazidis qualify as Mulk al Yameen, which is a Quranic expression for female slaves, lawful to be taken. She talked about the divine wisdom of slavery because um, this way you can avoid prostitution. And uh, it's a way to convert these people to Islam. So. And then she called upon the, capt the slaves to um, embrace Islam, to use this as an opportunity, specifically when there's a lot of concubines in Islamic history that are um, uh, respected. Of course, this caused uproar. 
I mean, imagine all of these Muslims around the world looking at these uh, crimes being committed in the name of their religion. Um, a dozens of religious uh, Islamic leaders actually went out and said that, you know, reintroducing slavery is prohibited in Islam because it was uh, abolished by universal consensus. Now, all of this justification is meaningless in international law. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here, but I have to say that sexual slavery is considered to be a, uh, an international crime, a serious crime, a war crime, crime against humanity that may reach the level of genocide under international law. Um, this hasn't been always the case, though. Um, it is true that you know, since 1926, slavery um, is defined as the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attaching to the rights of ownership are exercised. And it's also true that slavery for, I mean, um, is considered today, uh, at least the prohibition um, of committing slavery is considered to be a just cogent a norm, uh, something that cannot be abrogated, cannot be suspended, uh, in times of peace or in times of war, something that um, uh, no state can cite, for example, a state of emergency to, to do. Um, and also, it gives rise to an obligation ergo omnis on states to prosecute or extradite. You can't extend immunity to any person um, accused of committing slavery. This is all true, but it did take the international, international community, international law, 72 years to explicitly acknowledge that sexual slavery is a, um, a, a subcategory under war crime, crime against humanity that may, reach the, level, that may um, reach the level of genocide, and that was in the 1998 Rome Statute of the ICC. In the 1990s, things started to change. Now, of course, I'm not surprised by this late acknowledgement, and I'm sure that many of you in this room are not surprised either, because for the longest time, women, specifically in times of war, violence against women in times of war, um, has always been regarded as a, like a collateral damage, something that happens, because soldiers will always be soldiers and men will always be men. And um, they were ignored. Like, I mean, after all this damning evidence, against uh, the Japanese for their involvement in the case of Comfort Women. Um, we saw that uh, in the um, military tribunal that was established in Tokyo, um, the court failed to establish personal criminal responsibility against anyone in this case. Um, we saw that if you read the uh, 1949 Geneva Conventions, for example, uh, it talks about uh, outrage on personal uh, dignity, it talks about uh, you know, uh, prohibiting certain offenses against honor, but there is no, it, you have this feeling that when it comes to violence against, sexual violence against women, they were like dishonorable offenses rather than serious crimes uh, at par with other war crimes out there. But things started to change in the 1990s, thanks, I think, to a um, series of United Nations Security Council resolutions starting in the 1990s, as well as contributions by the International Criminal um, Court, um, the ICC, uh, the uh, International Criminal uh, Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, and for Rwanda. Now, the UN Security Council resolutions starting in 1999 onward, together they uh, prohibited states from including sexual violence in amnesty provisions and require them to prosecute those responsible. Also, uh, these resolutions embodied the willingness of the Security Council not only to apply sanctions against parties committing sexual violence in situations of armed conflict, but also to link the, prohibi the prohibition of sexual violence with maintaining international peace and security. Now, pursuant to these resolutions, the uh, Secretary General appointed a special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict, and he was, um, and he was tasked with presenting an annual report to the United Nations Security Council on sexual violence starting 2012. Uh, the reports including the na included the names of the worst um, sexual offenders. ISIS made the list in 2015. 
Now, um, one of the last resolutions that were taken by the Security Council specifically in relation to um, ISIS um, was Resolution 2331. Now this resolution condemns ISIS and uh, its extremist ideology that suppresses women rights and uses religion to justify the codification and institutionalization of sexual slavery for the purpose of attracting recruits, raising finances, and control and punishing and destroying communities. It also urges states to intensify their efforts to prosecute the perpetrators and support the victims in various forms. It also stresses the importance of protecting, collecting, preserving evidence so that investigations and prosecutions may occur in, may occur in the future. Um, also, these international courts that I talked about, they did contribute in various ways to the development of international law, specifically when it comes to uh, crimes of sexual violence. First of all, they contributed to the development of the understanding of sexual slavery and the conditions that mount to it. Now, it's true that in the statutes of the uh, both temporary tribunals, uh, there was nothing about sexual slavery in there. There was no explicit um, uh, explicit acknowledgement, if you want, that yes, sexual slavery is a war crime, crime against humanity, and um, and um, let me reach the level of genocide. However, in their case law, they did use the general prohibition against slavery in international law to uh, prosecute one of its forms, sexual slavery, and they managed to uh, convict in the um, uh, Kunarak case, sexual slavery uh, because of its constituting crime against humanity and, in, um, and uh, under the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, um, they were able to convict in the Akeso case uh, sexual slavery as an act of genocide. Um, it wasn't until the 1998 Rome Statute that this explicit formulation of sexual slavery was um, was added. Also the other contribution is the denial uh, they denied the use of the presence of consent. Consent is this magic formula that changes uh, crime into a non-crime, um, rape into like a sexual act. So this was important. It is enough here for the prosecutor to prove that uh, powers attached to the right of ownership was exercised for um, the present of consent to disappear, right? And then finally, uh, all of these courts acknowledge these are very sensitive cases, and that's why a number of protective measures were offered in courtroom to support the victims and the witnesses. So yes, it's clear. Sexual slavery is an international crime that should be prosecuted. But there's no one model of prosecution to be followed in this case. There's no clear uh, prescribed model. And I think that it is very challenging to reach one because of the challenges presented by this specific case. I mean, you have to understand that ISIS at its peak managed to control a land the size of Great Britain um, where more than 9 million people lived. 9 million people, twice the number of people living in Lebanon today, and more than the population of any of the Arab Gulf states, excluding Saudi Arabia. You know, this means that any policy, any decision that ISIS uh, issued, specifically it violated, if it violated human rights, it needed hundreds if not thousands of uh, lower level uh, officials and recruits to be implemented, right? So um, we're talking about thousands of perpetrators here. Of course, they have different uh, levels of responsibility. So we're talking about you know, um, the uh, top-ranking officials on ISIS, starting with Baghdadi, um, carrying the uh, biggest responsibility here. And then we have the mid-level ranking ISIS officials. Those, like for example, the emirs or the uh, governors um, that were responsible for supervising the day-to-day -day criminalities, if you like, of the system. Uh, one of them is the former ISIS emir of Mosul, Abu Layth, who was killed in one of the uh, attacks. And of course, there were the um, 
fighters who did the attack, those who are selling and buying, the middlemen who are facilitating all of this process. So, um, and as you see from the map, um, the crime does, is not only, um, is, did, is, did not only happen in Iraq. I mean, these women were, capt uh, were held captive in uh, Mosul, but then slaves were sold all over the territory that ISIS controlled. And some say that it even reached Turkey or you know, some Gulf states. So I want you to keep this in mind going forward. Um, I'm going to talk today about three routes of prosecution in this case. Uh, prosecution through national courts, prosecution through courts of third states, and uh, through the ICC. Now, national courts are courts of first resort. Like no court will hear a case um, outside the borders of that uh, the state where the crime took place, uh, unless national courts are unwilling or unable to do so. This is the complementarity principle. Um, now, when they do, they usually have, they hear cases and they base this, their decisions uh, on the domestic penal codes as well as on international criminal law and sometimes on both. All the penal codes of the Arab states in the Middle East and North Africa, of course, abolished slavery, including Syria and Iraq. This was reaffirmed by the 1990 Cairo Declaration on Human Rights and Islam. Um, also, um, the Iraqi and uh, Syrian penal code, they both prohibited uh, various acts of sexual violence. But we're not talking about ordinary kind of rape. We're talking about a grave crime here. Is it possible to establish um, a special tribunal specifically to prosecute ISIS? Of course. Nationally, of course, it did happen. It did happen in Sierra Leone, and it did happen in Iraq, of all places. Um, after the fall of the Iraqi regime in 2003, a special court was established. This was the Iraq's High Criminal Court, and it was established in 2005. The prosecutors and the judges were all Iraqis, and the jurisdiction was to hear all acts that violated parts of the Iraqi Penal Code as well as um, international crimes modeled after the ICC. And I have to say that this court was received with a lot of hope, with a lot, with a lot of enthusiasm, because it was local, because it uh, represented a step towards um, restoring the rule of law, and because it was independent of all of the institutions that were corrupted by the Ba'athist regime. There was also hope that this will open the door to prosecuting crimes of sexual violence, specifically because the statute of that court, Articles 12 and 13, they listed uh, various um, crimes of sexual violence, including sexual slavery. And they also established, actually, a special victim and witness unit for support. And they tried their best to encourage witnesses and victims to come forward and share their stories and testify. They did. And there was a lot of evidence collected specifically in um, connection to the uh, atrocities that took place in Al-Dujail and Al-Anfal in Iraq. However, the record was really disappointing for three reasons. First of all, they did not present any further legal consideration on the topic. Second, apart from rape, no other type of sexual violence was considered. And finally, and I find this really interesting. No defendant was accused of rape per se, although every other subcategory of crime against humanity was listed. I mean, saying this makes you realize that explicitly putting a sexual crime, in this case, sexual slavery, um, in a statute is not enough per se. Encouraging women to come forward is not enough by itself. I think what's important here is to tackle the misperceptions and the mischaracterizations um, that can take place during prosecution of these crimes. 
and to ensure that the prosecutors are trained. Now, even if this special national court passed with flying colors, the fact is it only, it's only there to prosecute just those that are most responsible. And we're ta when we're talking about sexual slavery in this case, we're talking about like thousands. So what do you do? I looked into the Berkeley study, which is a study that was conducted between 2011 and 2014. And the whole idea was to follow the adjudication process in Kenya, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Uganda to see how these countries dealt with widespread crimes of sexual violence. And they found that um, these countries established specialized police units and prosecution units um, where uh, the, where senior police officers would, would handle uh, cases uh, that involve crime sexual violence and then this was supervised by special prosecutors um, and then heard by general magistrate courts appealed through um, uh, regular judiciary um, or judicial channels just like other crimes and also um, they found that some countries like Liberia they established criminal court E in 2008, specifically to deal with crimes of sexual violence. And then there is this um, method that was used by Sierra Leone with the help of the UNDP when they um, dedicated a day in court just to hear courts of um, uh, crime of sexual violence. This was called Saturday courts because it was held on Saturdays in order to deal with the 700 backlog cases um, left over from the civil war in Sierra Leone. Mm. Now, regardless of what method Syria or Iraq want to follow in this case, there are certain challenges that should be addressed before this takes place. First of all, the importance of adopting a clear definition of the crime, the elements of the crime. Um, international um, hum uh, the Human Rights Watch, after following closely the adjudication process that took place in Rwanda after the genocide, found that because the Rwandan penal code did not provide clear guidance on the definition of genocidal sexual crimes that this um, left the judges with considerable uh, personal discretion in deciding the cases leading to inconsistencies. So this should be avoided. Now, in the Iraqi penal code, um, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and torture are clearly defined. But this is not the case in the 1949 Syrian Penal Code, so this should be addressed. Second, it is very important to abrogate uh, some provisions in the Iraqi and the Syrian Penal Code that impede the prosecution of crimes of sexual violence. For example, in the case of rape. Rape is criminalized in both countries, right? However, if the perpetrator agrees to marry his victim, the case is dismissed. This is Article 509 of Syrian Penal Code and Article 47 of the Iraqi Penal Code. Also, it's important to um, ensure that there is clear model for collaboration and cooperation between the different units. It's important to train the police officers, um, the prosecutors, the investigators as well. Now, one of the main reasons why I want to talk about courts of third states is because 30,000 foreign fighters working for ISIS come from 100 countries throughout the world, Arab countries, European, most of them it seems come from Jordan, then Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, Belgium is the EU capital for foreign fighters. So um, these courts can hear cases because the um, a defendant is a national of that country 
uh, resides in that country or is uh, part of a terrorist plan or attack against that country? Although the biggest chunk of the um, foreign fighters come from the Arab countries, but also there's a considerable group coming from Europe. Now, in Europe, there's no uniform model of prosecution. However, European countries, specifically Belgium, Germany, and the UK, um, it decided to add uh, anti-terrorism provisions to its domestic penal code by criminalizing public incitement to commit terrorist crimes, by um, criminalizing recruiting um, a recruitment to commit a terrorist act, providing training to commit a terrorist crime, and participating in training to commit a terrorist crime. However, I do think that this route is not effective in this case, for a very good reason. When these fighters are taken to face trial in, in Europe or elsewhere, um, they are not facing trial for crimes committed abroad for crimes committed in Syria and Iraq, but for being part of a terrorist organization or being um, or participating in a, like a terrorist plot against, a, against their own state. An example is this guy in the picture, Neil Prakash. He's an Australian ISIS foreign fighter, and he is now held in Turkey. Australia wants to extradite him. Um, for recruiting and sending some of his countrymen to the Middle East, but also for being part of a terrorist plot against Australia. Now, there are a lot of reports out there saying that this guy is responsible or supervised the medieval punishment that took place in Mosul. But if he did reach Australia, he will not be facing trial for that. He'll be tra facing trial for something else. For this reason, I wanted to talk about uh, prosecution, prosec prosecution under universal jurisdiction. As I said, when you talk about international crime, this g gives rise to an obligation of states to prosecute or extradite. According to Amnesty International, 163 states, or 84% of UN state members, can exercise universal jurisdiction over one or more crimes under international law, either as such crimes or as ordinary crimes under national law. Now, according to a report issued in 2016 by a non-governmental organization based in Britain called Redress, um, authorities in Austria, Finland, France, Germany, and Sweden have actually arrested and prosecuted 11 Syrians for committing crimes during the Syrian civil war securing the conviction in three cases. Also, a couple of uh, cases were prosecuted for war crimes um, during the Iraqi civil war against Iraqi uh, civilians. Now, I'm not aware of any case pending today in European courts that involve ISIS members specifically for the enslavement of the Yazidi girls and women. Um, I know that one of the cases involve a member of Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a um, Syrian um, radical Islamist kind of group that collaborated closely with ISIS at some point. But I'm not aware of any ISIS fighters standing trial. But I know that this can happen, and I know that um, courts of third state can be instrumental, not only in prosecuting um, foreign fighters, but for prosecuting foreign fighters for committing crimes of um, uh, crimes of you know sexual um, violence an example is the Senegal's extraordinary African chamber that was uh, established and was able to convict uh, former president of Chad Habre for committing uh, war crime crime against humanity um, including sexual slavery that was in 2016. And I think that it, I'm, I'm really interested to know more about this kind of court because it does present an alternative venue for prosecution, specifically when a lot of African states, in this case, they're very skeptical of, of the ICC. 
um, and also because of the instrumental role that the African Union as a regional organization played in ensuring that this prosecution did take place. Now, of course, the problem here that um, the establishment of these courts depend on the political agenda of the leadership of that country. In the case of Senegal, it was only after the election of the new president that this case went forward and the conviction did take place. Finally, the ICC. Of course, ICC was made for this reason. It does remain a very viable option. And I think it is suited uh, specifically for, uh, with the, um, it, it is, I think it's, it will be very instrumental in prosecuting those that are most responsible in the case of the Yazidis. Um, and it will be able to answer and to um, address a lot of challenges of this case for various reasons. First of all, because as I told you before, the crime didn't only involve in Iraq it involved Syria. The perpetrators do not only come from Iraq and Syria, they also come from 100 different states. So if this situation was transferred to the ICC through a United Nations Security Council resolution under Chapter 7, this will give the court the ability not only to um, investigate this crime um, in all of these different settings, but it will also place certain obligation on all countries, whether they are part of the ICC or not, to, coordinate, to, co to cooperate with the court. However, before we even reach that far, there are major hurdles. First of all, um, as you know, case situations are transferred to the ICC either by uh, member states or by the prosecutor or through a Chapter 7 resolution by the Security Council. Now, neither Iraq nor Syria are members of the ICC, which means that the ICC has no territorial jurisdiction in this case. Uh, what about transferring the case through the Security Council resolution? Well, as you know, the Security Council is not made of um, you know, states that um, take decisions based on their like, altruistic um, you know, um, considerations. Uh, they do take decisions based on their own political agenda. Now, in this specific case, Russia withdrew from the ICC last year, and they were very skeptical about the ICC and all of that. Um, China is very skeptical that, you know, if we transfer the situation to the ICC, this might um, lead to extending uh, the investigation to include maybe Bashar al-Assad. And they don't want that. He's a close ally. So what do you do? There is one possibility. Because as I told you, uh, we, ISIS um, has a lot of foreign fighters, people that may um, have a direct link to the enslavement that did take place in this case. Um, some of the fighters, as you saw in the graph before, uh, came from Tunisia, from Jordan, from France, from the UK, Belgium, Australia. All of these are members of the ICC. So there is a, there is a possibility that the ICC in this case has personal jurisdiction to prosecute and not territorial jurisdiction. The prosecutor and uh, her office did um, investigate this option, but they decided not to pursue it. Because according to them, those that are most responsible come from Syria and Iraq, and not from these 100 nations that I just mentioned. Now, I do urge the uh, prosecutor to reconsider. I want to read you um, a paragraph written by Emily Shertoff on this subject. And she said, while the leaders of an organization may make policies that permit or encourage crimes, it takes mid-level and lower-level officials to turn those policies into practice by ordering or directly committing crimes. This in itself makes them culpable. So too does their greater proximity to victims with whom they may be more likely to interact than our high-level officials who set organizational policy. So 
I do think that specifically if courts of third states and national courts are not doing enough to prosecute, maybe the prosecutor should reconsider this option. Even with that, serious challenges remain. It takes a long time to reach decisions. They only prosecute few. And um, this is if the case reaches the court to begin with. Uh, to conclude, <laughs> I'm not here um, trying to come up with a prosecution model to follow in this case. That's not my intention. I am trying to argue that because of the gravity of the crime, because of the number of the perpetrators, uh, the fact that they come from different countries, um, it may require the uh, coordination of the three courts that I just mentioned, national courts, courts of third states, and the ICC. But I do also think that there are various challenges to be addressed even before we reach that far. For one, who is responsible? for delivering these alleged perpetrators to face trial? Uh, who's going to supervi supervise this process? Who's going to ensure that their procedural due process rights are not violated? Uh, presently, these fighters are held by the Kurds, by the Iraqi um, um, army, and by the Syrian army. But there's no clear coordination between these three, and I don't think that there will be any in the near future because of the uh, recent tensions between the Kurds and the Iraqi government. This is one. Second, um, who's going to collect the evidence? We talked about this. <laughs> who's going to collect the evidence? Now, the United Nations um, see this as a priority and they did establish uh, a, a commission of inquiry and a panel to investigate uh, the Syrian um, um, you know, crimes that were committed in the Syrian civil war. However, recently, one of the members of the panel, specifically uh, Carla Del Ponte, uh, resigned. And she said that, well, this has been an alibi for the international uh, community to appear that they're doing something when they're not. So who is going to do that? I also think that a clear strategy that comprehensively incorporates crimes of sexual uh, violence in the investigation and prosecution from the beginning is important. It's important from the beginning that the investigators know that this is a priority, that we're not going to uh, put crimes of sexual violence in the back seat, that they are going to look at it at par with other war crimes and investigate accordingly. The training is important as well. Uh, I think that investigators need to be trained uh, in order to understand, specifically in cases of sexual violence, how do you conduct an interview, what to look for, what kind of questions you should ask, when to stop, what kind of privacy you're going to you know, uh, provide. Also, I think it's important for the prosecutors from the beginning to say, well, you know what, we're going for a, a quantitative approach. We want to uh, prosecute sexual slavery in this case uh, under genocide, because then they're going for uh, prosecuting a crime and looking for, um, looking to prove that these crimes were committed consistently, uh, systematically, and it was widespread. But if they're going for a qualitative approach, then they're trying to prove that um, a sexual slavery, um, um, I mean, was committed under crimes um, against humanity. So, I mean, these uh, will um, need a different evidentiary standard and they would require uh, different approaches in investigation. Uh, finally, yes, it is important to encourage women and uh, witnesses to come forward and testify. However, it is also important to prepare them for what's going to lie ahead uh, in their big day of court. They're going to be grilled, you know. Uh, they have to be, um, uh, they have to understand that they're going to be answering a lot of embarrassing questions about specific, you know, sexual acts and sexual body parts. And they can't be talking in codes. They have to be, I mean, they have to talk clearly in order to ensure that their testimony is of, you know, qu quality, that it will make a difference at the end. 
Um, I was planning to end this lecture really on a positive note, but the latest tension in Iraq uh, over Kirkuk between the Kurds and the Iraqi uh, forces is really preventing me from doing so, because I do fear that the first casualty of this tension will be the plight of Yazidi uh, women and girls, specifically when the international community now is um, looking at another tragedy, that of the Rohingya. Um, I fear that if, the, if ISIS members and uh, alleged perpetrators were not prosecuted, it will, it will not be because of shortage in prosecution models or because of lack of evidence, but I think it will be because of the lack of political will. Thank you very much.